OK, thank you. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Peter Matheson. I'm the principal of the University of Edinburgh. So welcome to uh, this evening's event. And before I get to the main speaker and introduce uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Abercrombie, um, we're going to hear from a couple of our student uh, entrepreneurs. Um, so the first will be Annie Vasudevan, co-founder and managing director of Asteria. And we're going to hear a short uh, video presentation um, uh, about uh, Asteria, uh, which we will queue up now, and then we'll get back to uh, the, the, the next stages. stages. Hello and welcome. My name is Adi Vasudevan, and I'm a fourth year electrical and mechanical engineering student at the University of Edinburgh. I'm also the founder and managing director of Asteria, the University of Edinburgh's student satellite development program. Before I get into that, I'd like to welcome Andrew back to the School of Engineering. I'm very much looking forward to hearing about his inspirations and stories from Scotland to California. Asteria is different from your conventional student engineering team. We have a very strong technical focus, but but we also have an understanding of the nuances that are required to take a mere student project and make it impactful on a nationwide or even global scale. These nuances include strong industry relations, dialogue with government, and business development ideas. This is in addition to building satellites in pursuit of, re of relevant and real world application. We're hosted at the Base Center in Central Campus alongside space and satellite companies working to develop the Scottish space ecosystem, although we're not a company ourselves. Student involvement in space in the UK is generally not associated with flight capable hardware or sustained application. Over the next few minutes, I'll be sharing with you how we plan to change this and what this means for, for students at Edinburgh and in the UK as a, as a whole. Our long-term goal for December, 2021 is to build and deploy Oracle One. This will be the UK's first entirely student-built satellite. Oracle One is a 3U CubeSat being designed for remote sensing of the Earth using hyperspectral imaging. Oracle One will be pursuing a scientific mission to help track mosquito-borne diseases, challenging yet relevant application for today's world in light of diseases like COVID-19, also supporting the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This mission will not only entail satellite development, but scientific analysis and collaboration with with the relevant organizations, from African governments to scientists in the UK. Oracle One has been in development since January, and we've been making significant progress in our engineering design and regulatory understanding. Since March, we've been formally collaborating with UK companies for the orbital launch of Oracle One in December of 2021. We're hoping to begin hardware development at the end of, uh, of this year with support from the university and alumni like yourself. And there's more info on that on our website. We also have a number of shorter term goals, with like a 100,000 foot scientific high altitude balloon launch called Aurora One from the Shetland Islands scheduled for next month and a suborbital payload launch scheduled for early next year. Our Aurora One balloon launch is a critical collaboration we've been developing with the uprising Shetland Space Center and we're making arrangements to utilize their ground station communication facilities for our satellite missions. I'm also very excited to announce a multi-university student research collaboration, starting with the University of Bristol. This collaboration will involve the theoretical pursuit of some of the most cutting edge aspects of space, like propulsion, economics, and space infrastructure. This team will bring together students across the country for, for discussions on space, in the 21st century, spurring potential research projects or even companies. All of us having been acquainted with virtual meetings in the past few months, it's an ideal time to start this initiative and engage students across the country. These kinds of projects are invaluable for practical learning here at the university to supplement and give context to our courses. They inspire students to be enterprising and practical. In mind, I have no doubt that great things will happen in the UK and global space industry in the coming years. Asteria has a lot of ambition and we're ready to take student engineering to the next level. If you would like more information or to support our goals in these relatively unpredictable times, 
please visit our website, asteria-space.com. Thank you very much and enjoy the talk. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 as uh, as uh, 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 the people on the presentation team here. So that was very interesting. Thank you very much for that. And the, the second video is going to be uh, from Neil Buchanan, founder and team lead of Endeavor, um, another student led organization. So, Rebecca, if you could play Neil's video as well. Hey everyone, I'm Neil, the team lead of Endeavour at the University's Rocketry team. Before we get into the main event tonight, Andrew's talk, which I'm sure you're all as excited as me to listen to. Honestly, I think he's living every head of a space enthusiast dream right now. Um, I just wanted to give a quick whistle-stop tour of Endeavour. So starting off a bit about myself, so I'm just going into the fourth year of my mechanical engineering degree now. And I started Endeavour, I guess, to show that students can make an impact on what I think anyway is even the most difficult field of engineering, rocket science. So we've seen, luckily, in, in Edinburgh, we've got teams like Hyped and Formula Student that have shown that you know, advanced technologies can be done by students, and we hope to do that as well. But for those of you that are kind of in the know about uh, UK rocketry history, you'll know that we don't have an awful lot, um, at least not for some time, uh, as evidenced by this graph for long. But we believe a lot of that is changing now. Within the UK itself, we have a goal of 10% of the global space market by 2030. And as Annie was mentioning before, we've got you know, a huge amount of need for Earth observation and climate change research that's only going to increase, um, unfortunately. So this is kind of combined now and backed up by companies such as Orbex and Skyroar starting up. And you know, along with that, we have this new generation of students such as myself and my teammates and hopefully lots of you as well who are inspired and you know, just dream at night of maybe one day going into the cosmos with um, all the great stuff we're seeing from SpaceX and Blue Origin. So I think you know, a human, human space exploration is perhaps the greatest adventure ever. And yeah, we hope to do a bit to kind of prop that up from a student perspective. But the team itself, uh, we're about one year old at the moment, um, very highly interdisciplinary well, and we all kind of have this common goal of helping it overcome I guess the space student capital of the UK. Um, but to do that, we know that we can't start sending rockets off into space anytime soon. It's going to be a long road to do anything like that. So we know that we need to start small, but dream big as well. And given we're a student team, also have a decent amount of fun on the way. Um, and this is starting off with things like you know, testing our Darwin flight computer Jeff in the main university library to make sure that the IMUs work in the lift up and down. And you know, even having a rocketry day in Hollywood Park um, to show off what we're doing. So a lot of these kind of things are part of our team ethos. And if any of this sounds interesting, we hope you join us as well. But for the plans for this year, we're kind of split into three main teams. So we have our technical team, we have our outreach team. For this year, we're starting something new with a creatives team as well. So our technical team, Darwin, the first project, this is looking into advanced sounding rockets. So this year we have, I believe, three launches scheduled for the rockets we're going to be developing over the year. One in um, west of Scotland, one in New Mexico, a space for America, and also one hopefully in Portugal in October. Two of them transonic and then one of them supersonic, which is going to be very exciting and nervous until it lands. Um, and then this is kind of a catalyst for our Maxwell project, which is looking at developing a 3D printed liquid bipropellant rocket engine, completely student developed. I think that's the first um, we've heard of one anyway, but most importantly, running on green um, sustainable fuels. So looking at bioethanol, high test peroxide, because as more and more rockets start going off, we need to sort of pioneer that research into greener ways of doing that, more sustainable ways. And then this kind of leads to our base product as well, which is looking at developing a scaled down version of an interplanetary lander that uses the kind of technology that SpaceX and Blue Origin, the big companies use with thrust vector control, but again, taking it down on a smaller scale to start off with. Well, then we have our creatives team because we know that um, you know, technical stuff alone isn't gonna do it. We need to capture the imagination, make people excited for the future. So the, the point of the creatives team is, I guess, to show a vision for the future of space exploration from Edinburgh students. And we're looking for designers, artists, architects who want to do that. Um, and hopefully by the end of the year, we can have a, a nice exhibition to show off our vision for, you know, 
future bases on, on Mars or you know, spaceship design, interiors, that kind of thing. And then accompanying with that is our outreach team. We're not going to be at university forever. We need the new generation, the people who are currently you know, doing highs, A-levels, um, GCSEs, to take on what we're doing at the moment and keep the dream alive so that one day, you know, the idea of space-faring rockets built in Edinburgh doesn't seem so far-fetched or dreamy. And to do that, you know, we've hosted Rocketry Days in Hollywood Park so far, and this year we're planning to do a series of online videos to get people, school children, excited about Rocketry projects and stuff they can do at home. So, that's everything from me for now. Any of that sounds incredibly interesting, which I hope it does, please do reach out to us and, and join. We've got an event on Thursday at 7 p.m. for a welcome event. Please, um, I'll go into more detail about our plans then. Please do join us. And then we also have our recruitment form online at the moment. So please keep on the lookout for that on social media. And yeah, I'll now hand you back over to the principal who will introduce the main event tonight. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Thank you very much and great to see the, uh, the creativity and energy of, of some of our current students. So um, that's been a terrific start to the evening. OK, so from current students to a uh, former student and, and one of the great um, joys of my job is getting to meet uh, some of the uh, alumni of the University of Edinburgh that have gone on to do some incredible things. And I was remarking just now when we were discussing at the beginning that this um, biography that's written for me of tonight's speaker is one of the best I've ever uh, read. And, and so although it is available for you to read, I am going to treat you to a couple of highlights out of it. So um, our speaker this evening uh, is Dr. Andrew Abercrombie. He uh, received an MEng in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Edinburgh in 2002 and a PhD in Motor Control from the University of Houston in 2006. Um, he has 20 years of experience of working at NASA, where his title at the moment is Lead of Human Physiology Performance Protection and Operations. And if you look at those uh, letters, that comes out as a great acronym, which is H3PO um, uh, for all your Star Wars fans out there. Um, so uh, partnering with organizations including SpaceX, Blue Origin, United States Air Force, United States Army, NASCAR, IndyCar and multiple universities, uh, providing world class health and performance in extreme environments on Earth and in space. A really fascinating uh, topic. Andrew's professional interest with NASA focus on measurement and optimization of human performance and operations in extreme environments and have included studies in deserts, active volcanoes, Arctic impact craters and reduced gravity parabolic aircraft. Andrew's favorite extreme experiences include living underwater for two weeks during the NEMO 14 mission, diving in an Antarctic lake beneath four meters of ice, fighting wildfires in California and watching East Fife versus Cowden Bay. Uh, I told you it was a great biography. Um, Andrew, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you virtually back to your alma mater. Uh, we're very interested to, to hear about uh, your, uh, your, your topic and the title is an exciting one. The title is Ice, Space and Fire, Surviving and Thriving in Extreme Environments. Andrew, welcome and over to you for your talk this evening. Thank you for joining us. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Matheson. Uh, let me just go ahead and uh, pull up my screen. Um, all right, can you confirm for me that you can see what I'm presenting here, please? I can see it, Andrew, yeah. Fantastic. So far, so good. All right, so, so yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good evening um, or good afternoon or good morning, depending on, on where you are in the world today. Um, yeah, and, and thanks to um, to Annie and Neil for, for those um, uh, overviews of the, of the projects that are happening at Edinburgh now. I can't tell you how um, kind of uh, excited that made me because putting myself back in 1997 when I started, um, those were exactly the kinds of things I was looking for that, that just I, I couldn't find, at least I couldn't find in uh, anywhere in Scotland. Um, and so th those kinds of um, uh, efforts um, are, are just so important for um, kind of allowing people such as myself in that position to, to pursue their interests. So uh, I can't tell you how, how much it, it warms my heart to, to see those those efforts um, um, starting up. And yeah, the CubeSats, um, actually I'm, I'll explain where I am in a, in a minute. But, but Cal Poly University, where my wife uh, actually teaches aerospace engineering, that's one of the places that, that started out uh, CubeSats um, 
several years ago at this point. So I'm, I'm very familiar with, with uh, CubeSats and, and all the great um, engineering uh, that happens as part of that program and the opportunity to actually fly some of these things in space. So that's great to see. Um, all right, without further ado, uh, let me get started. So um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I would love to tell you that I'm joining you from Mission Control today, um, but I'm actually talking to you from my garage in San Luis Obispo in California. Um, uh, I'll explain a bit about the career path that, that got me to my to my garage today, but but mostly I want to share some of the things that I've worked on over the years that I found really fascinating, um, learning about um, living and exploring in extreme environments, um, as well as hopefully how that that work and those experiences have, have helped us to kind of understand and overcome some of the some of the unique challenges, uh, particularly with respect to space exploration. Um, the the the, the, the image you're seeing just now, it shows where San Luis Obispo, also known as SLO, uh, is in relation to Fife, uh, which is where I'm from, uh, and relative to Houston, uh, which is where my job actually is. And, and prior to, to the global pandemic, uh, what I would normally do is travel back and forth from, from SLO to Houston for about one week every month, and, and then I would spend the rest of the time teleworking from California. Uh, this is a picture of San Luis Obispo. And it's pretty much what it looks like every springtime uh, before the grass turns brown in the summer. Um, and if you were to take this same picture about a week ago, it would have looked less like the Shire um, and a lot more like Mordor um, because we had the, the wildfires here in California were just blowing this thick smoke across the entire state, in fact, a lot of the country. And so it was brown, orange. Uh, it really looked a little bit like Armageddon. I'm happy to say that it's blue skies outside now, and um, it's San Luis Obispo is usually a, a great place to live. Um, this picture here uh, is looks similar. This is actually London Lynx uh, and Lower Largo uh, in East Fife, which is where I grew up. Uh, the grass there is more consistently green than it is here, that's for sure. Um, I, and I actually genuinely do get to the point here in California where sometimes I miss rain. I never thought I would say that, but um, during the summers, it, you go months without rain, and uh, uh, somehow I actually got to the point where I miss it. Um, I uh, at London Mill, uh, London Mill Primary School in London Links, and then later at Buckhaven High School. Uh, my favorite subject was actually always PE. Um, I played football a lot, played a bit of rugby, did some gymnastics. I liked athletics, um, but also was a season ticket holder at, at Bayview. In fact, my oldest daughter, uh, who's now 12, she was only three months old when she went to her first East Fife game. Uh, and actually, when we were in Edinburgh a couple of years ago, we went and saw East Fife playing Hearts at Tyne Castle. And to this day, uh, any time uh, my wife and I will kind of question whether the, the language on a movie or a TV show is appropriate for our, our young daughter's ears, they will invariably remind us that they went to see an East Fife versus Hearts and the language that they heard there was worse than anything they've ever heard on television before. And I think they're absolutely correct uh, for that part. Um, so Buckhaven, uh, it wasn't the fanciest of schools, but I uh, had a lot of uh, really dedicated teachers, uh, made a lot of great friends there and, and got a really solid education. And it was there that my, my life really kind of changed paths um, on the morning of my my, my higher physics exam, I, it was just before I turned 17, I was asked to come to the rector's office and was asked whether I'd like to attend an all expenses paid trip to Houston for a, a new uh, international space school that they were um, starting. And so, uh, of course, I said, well, yes, please, that would be fine. Um, I, I hadn't even been on an airplane before at this point. Uh, so by the time I, I took off from Edinburgh, it was already one of the best experiences of my life. Uh, and then when, when I touched back down in Edinburgh um, three or so weeks later, uh, I knew that that's where I wanted to end up, was, was back at, at NASA. So I, uh, at that point, I planned on spending my final year at Buckhaven um, at, at high school when I returned. But then instead, I called up for various reasons, called up the, the um, mechanical engineering department at Edinburgh and asked if it was too late to apply to start in the autumn. And so that's what I ended up doing. Um, I, when I got to Edinburgh, I stayed in, in Cowan House at Pollock Hall's residence um, and then made a lot of great friends there that I still meet up with when I get the chance. I uh, joined the University Air Squadron. That's the, the picture in the lower left there is, is um, Lukers, RAF Lukers, where I learned to fly. Played a lot of intramural football for a team called Jossie's Giants. Um, and uh, 
academically, I took every opportunity possible but because, you know, as I mentioned, we didn't have these kind of aerospace um, projects and opportunities there at the time. I just took every opportunity to make my project work as aerospace related as possible. And then for my, my MEng work placement, industrial placement, I was able to, uh, to work at Johnson Space Center, uh, not actually just for the required, I think it's six months, but I spent almost a full year there and um, uh, worked on my master's thesis there. So, so the university was very uh, accommodating and flexible and allowing me to, to kind of really uh, pursue that aerospace angle, which was extremely valuable for me. Um, I worked there in the flight mechanics lab in a project called X38. Um, and then, yeah, I, th I think that's a picture of me graduating from my files. And then you'll also notice, uh, you guys will all realize this, but as an engineer, um, I didn't spend my time at Old College. I was in Appleton Tower and, uh, and King's Buildings, but I like this picture better. Okay, so yeah, 20 years at NASA, including time during which I was in school. Um, as soon as I graduated from Edinburgh, I moved out to Houston where I started working PhD um, in, in biomechanics and motor control. Uh, while I was actually working in the neuroscience lab at the at the space center, um, doing my research. So since then, I've been fortunate to be part of a lot of great teams uh, and learn a lot of different things and have have some different interesting roles in the process. Um, I mentioned the the X thirty eight project there. That's what you see at the top left. Um, I learned to be a scientist during my PhD, and I still do applied scientific research today. Uh, I was an engineer and uh, actually a deputy project management uh, manager for the, the lunar rover project you see in the middle there. Uh, I got to become an aquanaut during the NEMO 14 mission, which I'll talk about a bit later. I've uh, been a test subject for a lot of different studies. I learned to scuba dive and, and worked as a research diver in, in various places. Um, and then I learned to fly these cool submersible things you see there. That's what we were actually trying to learn how, how we would explore on asteroids, uh, which is something that NASA was asked to do a few years back. Um, and so I, while I still do a lot of these different roles whenever I get the chance, especially the diving ones, um, I know my, my role now is, is as a, a lab lead uh, as of H3PO, which is a whole different uh, kind of challenge, but, but one that I'm really enjoying immensely. All right, so the, the lab H3PO, um, uh, you heard the, what the name stands for. Uh, note that we, we care very much, in, in our, as you'll see in our mission statement, about health and performance um, on Earth as well as in space. Uh, and we also identify collaboration as a core component of our mission statement. We've got a team of, of between 40 and 50 engineers, scientists, medical doctors, software developers, and other talented, interesting people. Um, uh, all of whom know more than I do about one or many more in some cases of the, the various disciplines that you see listed here. Uh, and it's really a, a fantastic team that I'm, I'm very privileged to, to lead up. Uh, so then at, at this point, before getting into some of the specific challenges and strategies associated with, um, with extreme environments, I want to show a short video. And this video gives a quick description of where NASA is going with its current programs. Uh, it's a little less than four minutes long. Um, I won't talk during it, but let me know if you can't hear the audio. Um, and Rebecca, I'll trust you to, uh, to let me know that. Give me just one moment. Fifty years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. A space launch system. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. 
we need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and stay, to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor. And yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. All right. Um, so now you know a bit about the kind of bigger picture of where sort of, uh, NASA is and, and is, is going. Um, I'll talk about some of the specific challenges that we're tackling um, from the, particularly from the human perspective. And this is um, far from comprehensive. It's just a kind of few highlights um, that I think that speak to the, the challenges that I've been working on in recent years and that the, the team that I work with uh, most closely is, is, is trying to tackle. Uh, and, and you'll see I've kind of grouped that into to four sort of different categories here, which I'll go through. Uh, first one I'll talk about is uh, reduced gravity. So I'm not actually going to show a lot of data in my charts. I think this is actually the only data, data chart um, in the whole thing. Um, but this is an example of some of the physiological changes that occur during spaceflight. There are a lot of other changes that do occur. Um, and that's one of the things I learned a bit about during my, my PhD work. Um, but these uh, muscle strength and aerobic capacity are two of the areas that, that my uh, lab uh, now focuses on a, a lot. And so what you can see here is that, that both muscle and aerobic strength are reduced uh, during space flight. And this is in spite of our best efforts to, to preserve them. And, and while these, these decrements that you see are recovered, um, uh, I'll explain that uh, more in a minute. Like we, we need our astronauts to be as fit as possible both during their mission and at the end of the mission. Um, and so the way we are our best um, uh, countermeasures, as we call them uh, at this point, are exercise countermeasures. And on this International Space Station, ISS, we use three of them, a bike, a resistive exercise device and a treadmill with a, with a harness that, that holds you down uh, onto the treadmill. These aren't the best um, pictures of them, but, uh, but I think you get the idea. Uh, they, they work fairly well, um, you know, you saw the, the dates in the previous chart, they're decrements, but they're not massive. Um, but these are very large and heavy devices. And for exploration missions, every gram and every cubic meter of volume in the spacecraft is, is um, precious. And we're working to find ways to get as much um, efficacy out of these devices as possible. Um, and uh, so, so we need uh, smaller, lighter weight exercise devices that work well. 
Um, we're working actually with the European Space Agency, uh, who are developing a prototype exercise device that's hopefully going to fly on ISS uh, within the next couple of years. We're also looking at ways to make our prescriptions more effective and more efficient, because as it is, we spend a lot of time uh, every day exercising, and we could ideally be spending that doing other things. Um, this is an area where we can learn a lot from Earth-focused research studies, and, and we work with uh, universities and companies. Um, I've got a meeting this week with Adidas, for example, uh, talking about um, ways that we can uh, kind of help each other out. And so we're, we're trying to ensure that we're using the best available practices and technologies, uh, and what we learn, we share. Okay, so one of the reasons we need to stay as fit and strong as possible is that now that shuttle has been retired, which landed like an airplane more or less, um, all our current and future spacecraft are capsules that land with a, a thud. And depending on how the landing goes and how big that thud is, this can, can injure your crew members. Um, the spacesuits themselves can actually increase the risk of injury because they're bulky, they've got hard parts in them, the helmet weighs a lot. Uh, the, the suits are designed to protect against depressurization of the cabin in the space environment not to protect you from impacts. Uh, and if our muscles and bones are significantly deconditioned, then the likelihood of being injured as a result of landing is, is even higher. Um, and so part of our, our H3PO team has been working with a lot of different organizations, uh, some of them you see listed there, uh, to develop and validate predictive injury models, which have then been applied to the design of spacecraft, including SpaceX, uh, Boeing, the Orion spacecraft you saw in the video, to ensure that the risk of injury um, is reduced to acceptable levels. We don't eliminate risk, but we can significantly reduce it and then try and quantify what that residual risk level is. Um, if you watched the recent SpaceX launch uh, and heard about the wind constraints that they were worried about uh, before launch, those, those, those wind placards, as they call them, they actually came from our team because they identified certain scenarios in which um, it could affect the, the landing impacts, essentially. OK, and uh, the last aspect of reduced gravity I'll, I'll ask you to think about is the fact that it, while it can certainly make some things easier, like carrying massive objects, it can also make things more difficult. And on Earth, uh, we actually rely on our ground reaction forces to provide us control over our bodies and other objects. When you have reduced ground reaction forces, or even no ground reaction forces at all, it can make tasks um, suddenly very challenging. Uh, and a few years ago, NASA was actually asked, I mentioned this, I think, to, to consider capturing and exploring an asteroid, uh, which would have been, you know, the asteroid essentially would have negligible gravity of its own. This turned out to be very challenging because unlike the space station, uh, where we're, we are weightless, but it's designed for astronauts to work on it, and it's got convenient handholds and restraints anywhere that you try and work on it, asteroids don't have any of that. Um, so there's some um, pictures of different uh, testing concepts on the top right there is kind of moving and sampling um, uh, in the that's in the neutral buoyancy lab underwater actually. It's a lot of fun but very challenging and what we found was that there really weren't a lot of great ways to do this. Um, fortunately the moon seems to be a kind of better uh, middle ground. It's about one six gravity uh, and uh, that seems to be enough to have reasonable control but also to make your spacesuit nice and light. Um, bottom left picture there is is that's in the parabolic uh, parabolic aircraft, which uh, you can see you don't have a whole lot of space in there. But the, um, uh, the 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 parabolic flight environment is good in that you um, actually weigh the appropriate amount inside the spacesuit, so the interactions between the human and the suit are realistic. You can just only unfortunately get twenty to thirty seconds of reduced gravity at a time. Um, the Argo system on the on the bottom right there, that's a kind of mechanical offloading system that can be very precise. Oh great, car alarm. I'll just have to bear with me. Um, stand by. All right. Um, so yeah, par parabolic flight also known as the Vomit Comet. It's the most fun, um, but but the, uh, the the volumetric constraints and the the limited time constraints mean that we actually don't use it that much and and. It's kind of an open question right now if we will use that um, really at all in the in the coming kind of uh, year or two. All right, moving on. So the next thing we're going to think about is the idea of inherently hazardous environments, by which I mean places that can break and kill things very quickly unless you take some sort of protective measures. Now, there's a significant psychological impact of knowing that you can be a single uh, bad decision away from dying uh, and 
I'll talk some more about some of the psychology uh, in, in a little bit, but thinking for now just about the physical and physiological implications of the space environment, we need pressurized spacecraft with life support systems um, if we're going to survive for more than a few seconds in space. If we really want to get out and explore in this hazardous environment, that means we need a spacesuit. And we're actually designing and building a new spacesuit just now called XEMU. And I'm going to talk about just a couple of the specific design considerations that are important to this idea of not just staying alive, but actually thriving and, and performing at a high level. And the first is uh, sizing and fit. So during Apollo, um, they performed a maximum of three EVAs, spacewalks, um, per mission. The suits were worn out by the end, the crew were tired and some were injured, and the capacity of the crew members um, and the suits to, to do more moonwalks is not really known. Some of them may have been able to keep going, but, but they were really designed for that kind of one, two or three EVAs and then go home. Um, the moon is tough on humans and, and on the hardware. Uh, those Apollo crew members also had custom fitted spacesuits for future missions uh, to be sustainable. We're going to have a fleet of reusable spacesuits that need to fit some of the smallest females all the way up to some of the largest males, including astronauts who haven't even been selected yet. So we don't know what kind of body shape they even have. Um, you can have the perfect spacesuit and the perfect astronaut, well trained, happy, healthy fit. But if you don't match the spacesuit to the um, to the crew member, then we know that your chance of uh, reduced performance and injury risk, uh, it, we, we know that ha that happens. That's a known issue with our current spacesuit. So we're doing a lot of work, and this is actually mostly performed by our sister lab, Anthropology and Biomechanics Facility, where I used to work, um, to, to come up with a fleet sizing strategy that allows us to, to acceptably accommodate all these different um, body shapes and sizes. And then the other consideration I want you to think about is how do we make sure that the spacesuit that's keeping us alive on the one hand doesn't actually injure us in itself. Uh, injuries in spacesuits happen uh, both on the ground during training and in spaceflight. And as we're building a new spacesuit that, that has increased mobility compared with the, the Apollo spacesuit, how do we anticipate new injury mechanisms before they happen? Uh, and this is another case where we combine modeling work with human in the loop testing. Uh, occurring throughout the design process. You, you'll see this is a recurring theme with, with my, my talk today. Uh, our, our same experts that worked on the occupant protection for spacecraft landings that I just talked about, they're working on protecting the crew members in the XEMU when they return to the moon because uh, they're going to be performing um, longer EVAs and more frequent EVAs for missions that can potentially last uh, months, not just days. The other thing we know about extreme environments is that it likes to break things. Um, and in fact, one of our lead designers of the, the lunar rover that I showed earlier, his definition of an extreme environment, uh, he said that's anywhere that's more than 15 minutes from a hardware store. Um, and he had a point there. Um, we, we, the conversation came up while we were doing some testing um, out in the desert. And he also liked to say that during these long tests out in Arizona, he says, if we're lucky, something will break and we'll learn something. And, and that was kind of the point in a lot of our testing, not all of the testing. Um, we didn't want everything to break. Um, it depends what breaks, depends what you're trying to learn in the test. Um, the, on the slide here, it lists some of the things that our team of five people managed to break in the space of about a month uh, in Antarctica. Uh, in that case, we had no ability to resupply, so we fixed what we could uh, and we were prepared so that uh, in almost all cases, we had the spares that we needed when we couldn't fix something. But the challenge of choosing the right spares uh, for the moon and especially for Mars is huge. And, and to the point that the total mass of spares uh, may be roughly the same as the total mass of food that we bring. Uh, and that's not even protecting for everything. I, just this morning, actually, before I switched over to, to this talk, uh, I'll, I'll spare you the details, but it's, it is tons and tons of spares that we're talking about bringing. And for every kilogram that you want to have delivered to the surface of the moon, the gear ratio, meaning the, the amount of mass that must be launched off the surface of, of planet Earth first, is, is many, many, many times more than that, that one kilogram. So it's an incredibly important part of your whole mission planning. Um, so the takeaway here and, and part of the point in the whole presentation I saw earlier today is that the importance of testing frequently and iteratively throughout the design process, figure out what's going to break, how often is it going to break, how many of those spares do we think we need because nothing lasts forever. For hardware, 
break as much as possible on the ground so you break as little as possible in flight and even then bring spares bring spares um of course we don't bring spare humans and we can't break the humans either so they're a whole uh, different kind of challenge and really more of the focus of, of what my team does now all right the next section i'm kind of calling time and resource constrained exploration because this really captures the essence of what a lot of our work has done um, particularly in analog environments over the years uh, and so when every gram and every minute matters, what do we do and what do we bring with us? How do we use the, the things that we bring and uh, what skills do we need to bring with us? And how can we most effectively use the expertise that we have back on Earth? Um, we need to stay alive, but we also want to be as productive as possible while we're at our destination. We, of course, we use um, detailed analysis and discussion. But we, uh, to, to try and kind of determine these things, decide these things. But we also get out in the field and test out uh, concepts where we typically find that some things work well and are really useful. Some things don't work well and would be fairly useless even if they, they actually did work. Um, and then, of course, most things end up falling up, falling kind of somewhere in between. Um, sometimes we're, uh, we'd be testing equipment or software tools. Other times it would be uh, testing different strategies for how to explore and how best to communicate with a team of experts that we would have in a simulated mission control. Um, often we test both at the same time. Um, I, I mentioned my role in the, in the Lunar Electric Rover uh, project. Um, testing was a critical component of that, uh, both to evaluate the prototype vehicle itself, as well as understanding how we were actually going to use it. Uh, and a lot of that testing happened in the, in the Arizona desert. Um, also worth noting here is that we use, you can maybe make out in some of these pictures, we often use backpacks that simulated the informatics capabilities of the spacesuit without actually requiring the test subjects to wear pressurized spacesuit prototypes themselves because wearing those big heavy things in Earth gravity would actually confound our test objectives by making our, our test subjects exhausted and possibly injuring them. Um, we do the suited testing at JSC and reduced gravity simulations. Uh, we also used Humvees in the Arctic to test out operations concept where we could simulate the relevant capabilities of the rover, um, but do so in a larger scale of, uh, with more realistic terrain and topography. And so as long as the Humvees could, could uh, simulate the relevant capabilities of the rovers that we were actually kind of evaluating, we didn't need a high fidelity prototype. Um, we were trying to understand the operations, not the technology. And so the take home point here is, is not only restating the importance of testing in general, but recognizing that you can and you should test your operations as well as the technology. Otherwise, you probably won't have the technology that you need um, and or you're going to be inefficient, ineffective and possibly unsafe once you actually do get into operations. This, of course, isn't unique to extreme environments, um, but but the importance of this for is, is amplified for uh, cases in which the, the consequence of failing to adequately understand operations can be catastrophic. All right, uh, now moving on to uh, isolation, distance and duration, as I call it. So I think you understand this, but uh, Mars is a long way away. Uh, missions to Mars are going to take, uh, well, the, the latest numbers I saw there, uh, actually I scribbled it on a post-it. Um, Basically, depending on whether we, which class of mission we do, kind of 750 to 1200 days in duration, kind of door to door. Um, now there are analog tests in the US, in Russia, and probably other places around the world where you can put subjects in a pretend habitat for hundreds of days and look at how to keep them happy and healthy. But there's a difference between being um, con confined uh, with a small group of people when you know you can get out at any point versus being in a truly um, uh, what we call uh, isolated, confined and extreme environment where decisions can have life or death implications and where you can't just uh, tap out uh, when things start getting difficult. Okay, so one place that NASA uses for training as well as for testing and technologies and operations is NEMO, um, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations where we have crews of six people live in an underwater habitat on the bottom of the Atlantic, a few miles off the coast of Florida. This is what the habitat looks like on a nice clear day. Uh, and it really is an incredible place, one of my favorite places on the planet. I was fortunate to be selected as a NASA crew member on the NEMO 14 mission. And in a kind of bizarre coincidence, um, 
Chris Hatfield, a Canadian astronaut, uh, he was selected as the commander of the Nemo mission. So back during the space school that I mentioned, uh, during the kind of intro section, um, when I was 17 and went to, to Houston for the space school, uh, the Hatfields were my host family. So I lived with them for a couple of weeks in Houston when I was 17. And then Chris and I spent two weeks living together with four other people uh, on the bottom of the, the Atlantic when I turned 30. And so I actually got a call from the International Space Station on my birthday while I was while I was living underwater. And then before the end of the, the mission, it was also announced that Chris and Tom Marshburn, who's one of the other astronauts in the crew, would fly on the space station together as crewmates. And, uh, and Chris would be the commander of the ISS. So, um, and this is, a, this is Tom Marshburn here, um, medical doctor and astronaut. He's the, the one on the right. Um, okay, so then the next couple of slides just show some of the simulated EVAs that we would do during the NEMO missions. They would have test objectives of their own, um, which I won't get into, but um, important to note here is that NEMO is a saturation diving environment, meaning that you can get potentially fatal decompression sickness if you surface from the habitat without going through an almost day long decompression protocol first. And while it's, um, the, it's one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life, uh, this NEMO mission, there are a lot of hazards and a very busy mission timeline that keep your mind focused. And, and it really does have, in that respect, many of the attributes of a real space mission, which is why NASA uses it and the astronaut office likes to use it for uh, training and selection of their crew members. Uh, also noteworthy is that you've uh, probably heard a lot of, uh, or many of you will have heard of Chris because of his social media work that he did during his ISS, ISS expedition. Um, so social media training and outreach was actually a part of this NASA, uh, sorry, this NEMO mission. And we find that it was actually an effective way of staying in contact with other humans and, and being reassured that although we weren't actually seeing anybody, um, other people out there actually were still following us and, and cared about the mission. And a lot of the public enjoy being a part of what was happening as well. And so Chris is a perfect demonstration of someone who kind of took those lessons learned from this uh, analog environment, applied it to his ISS mission extremely successfully. Um, and that was that was a, a, a I'll say at least in, in some part, a, a, a success story for Nemo. Um, that was a 14 day mission. Uh, it was definitely uh, we call it ice isolated, confined and extreme. Um, I had a less confined but more isolated and extreme experience as part of a, a five person astrobiology expedition to Antarctica. We were exploring a pair of frozen lakes uh, in the mountains there. I'm not an astrobiologist. Um, my role was as the, the sole field engineer and one of two uh, research divers. But I was also interested in, in this expedition as a potential uh, space flight analog. What was particularly interesting to me was that Antarctica was already being used by NASA to study confinement and, and essentially boredom during uh, Antarctic winters where people are cooped up for months on end. Um, it's always dark and there's not much to do. And so conversely, we were actually there exploring. We were, um, we were often having fun. It was hard work, but it was fun and it was exciting as we experienced new things and made discoveries, kind of the opposite really of the, the winter over uh, experience. Um, we were exploring, uh, we were uh, out there kind of doing doing science, experiencing kind of new, new um, but whether it was diving or, um, you know, getting water samples, kind of looking through them in the microscope, seeing something you didn't expect. Um, these new discoveries really kind of um, made, the, made the time pass quickly for the most part. Uh, we were working hard, we were feeling productive, and uh, that's very much the way that I expect our astronauts to be when they're on the surface of Mars. The, the trip out and the trip back may be a different story, but when they're there conducting EVAs and making discoveries, I think they're going to um, find that it's a whole lot different than the, the, the first and last part of their mission. Um, for me, the, the ice dives were a highlight. They were kind of like the EVAs in my mind. Um, you know that you had four meters of ice um, and the, the, the next series of slides show from one of my favorite dives which was beneath the ice alongside a huge glacier and that this glacier wall um, so, so you have the, the kind of ice cap here the glacier plunged down um, into the lake so as you descended through the ice tunnel there was this wall of ice alongside you um, and so you descend down toward the bottom of the lake 
you've got this this wall of, of glacier and the main objective of this dive is actually to collect a sediment sample from the from the glacier so this is what you see as you're kind of getting ready to go down into the um uh, the the hole that we kind of melt and then cut through the ice we would dive solo and you're on an umbilical which allows you to actually talk as well with communications inside the the dive helmet uh, descending down through the ice I just like to use these pictures. Um, and that's kind of what you see as you're getting down in there. There's the kind of almost scallop looking uh, ice there off the glacier ridge itself. And you'd find the sediment. Um, and the only way that gets in there, because the, 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 the lake is permanently frozen on top. So this is um, content that's worked its way through the glacier. And so really interesting what kind of um, um, life we can find uh, within this kind of sediment. And in this case, coming back up and then returning the uh, up through the, the ice tunnel and then returning the sample. So yeah, for me, that kind of thing was super exciting. There were some slightly kind of worrying moments as well at times, but, but even so, after almost a month of camping in a tent in the mountains in Antarctica before other people, you eventually get to the point where there are fewer new experiences and, and the desire to get back home to the comforts of family and friends um, uh, it grew stronger. However, even at even at that point when we were starting to feel sort of ready for home, our team was strong and productive. And a lot of that is due to what NASA calls or refers as expeditionary skills, and uh, which I think of as, as the ability to to play well with others, to be considerate of others, and, and always do your share um, and do do it with a good attitude. And compared with astronaut selections and training in previous decades. NASA now puts a whole lot more importance in personalities and soft skills because uh, the ability to, to play well with others is absolutely essential for, for long duration missions. It's also essential to know that when you put your life in the hands uh, of your teammate that you can count on them. So that the, the technical competency uh, cannot be sacrificed at all. All right, um, I'm not gonna talk that much longer. Um, there were other relevant observations from Antarctica, some of which I've already touched on. Um, the importance of communication protocols that work even when you have little or no ability to actually talk in real time is critical, as is the, the, the related need for software and informatic systems that allow for efficient and effective uh, collection, synthesis, and, and utilization of information that's being collected uh, during the course of your exploration. And so that brings me to the last just couple slides here, um, which is, are on a project called Basalt. Uh, which incorporated both of these observations uh, and uh, it, it actually included a, a co-investigator from the University of Edinburgh. My, my non-astrobiologist description of basalt is that we used ancient lava flows in Idaho and active lava flows in Hawaii to learn about what makes bacterial life want to thrive in some volcanic places but not in others and then use that information to help us understand where and how to look for evidence of previous life on Mars. We also evaluated software tools and informatics to assist with exploration, as well as operations concepts and, and the communication protocols that I mentioned, um, focused on science exploration techniques when dealing with long communication delays. We would like, artificially introduce these 20 minute each way communication delays between our mission control and the, and the field team. Um, and yeah, one of the, the lead astrobiologists was uh, Professor Charlie Kukal from Edinburgh. Um, we learned a lot, we published a lot um, uh, of what we learned as we always try and do. Uh, I've got a couple of examples of the informatics there. Uh, you saw one of them. Uh, th this is an augmented reality technique uh, developed by NASA and uh, JPL and Microsoft, which aim to improve training for crew members before they actually perform their EVAs as well as assisting experts in mission control and how to identify and prioritize objectives for crew members uh, and how to then interpret the information that we collect uh, during the spacewalks. This uh, version of this is also actually being used uh, for Mars exploration for, for uh, robotic, uh, the, the robotic exploration missions right now. Okay, so uh, I've probably talked a bit longer than I should have. I'll leave you with a, a quotation that I really like from uh, Roald Amundsen which I think captures my take home points uh, more eloquently than, than I ever could. Um, if I were to paraphrase, I'd say that, um, or if I were to offer advice to, to our young engineers, um, Annie, Neil and others, I'd say that my philosophy is that I like to test the same way that I plan to vote this November. 
which is early and often. So um, thanks for your attention. Thanks for the opportunity to, to talk with you all today. Uh, thanks to uh, Rebecca, Karen, Carolyn, Amani for, for setting this up. Um, and with that, uh, and I should also thank the university. Uh, of course, they, they put me in this position. They gave me the, the education and the opportunity to, to follow my passion. So I think that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. So my name is Prohoro Brody. I'm the head of the School of Engineering. And uh, thank you very much, Andrew. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, I particularly like your emphasis on testing early and often. And some of you may see behind me the university's new test facility, Fastblade, which we're building in, in Fife, also your, your home county. So there's been a whole lot of questions and I, I'm not going to be able to ask them all. But maybe I'll start with the most popular one. And this is obviously from the students. So the students want to know how you as a, a non US citizen managed to get into NASA. And have you any advice for how they might be able to do it? Yeah, uh, good question. So yeah, that, that's a question I yeah, I, I get asked sometimes. So um, my own particular circumstance was yeah, the, there was the kind of, if you like, the foot in the door through the space school, and that of course uh, can help uh, in some ways, but you still end up coming coming up against kind of uh, laws and immigration laws and visas and things like this. My particular path was um, as part of my my uh, industrial placement, I got a J-1 visa. That And again, this, this was back in 97. The rules have probably changed since then. I got a J-1 visa. Uh, that allowed me to to do basically kind of industrial placement. You know, as long as it's part of education, it, it offers up some opportunities. Um, when I graduated and then did my PhD, I got an F1 visa, so I was still still you know um, not U.S. citizen or green card holder. Then part of the F1 visa allowed me to work in an in industry relevant to my field of study for I believe it was up to 20 hours a week or something. So that's when I was working in the neuro lab. Uh, and then um, at the, at, while studying towards my, my PhD, um, my, my path at that point or my, my plan was to apply for something called a national interest waiver, which is a way it, it's, an, it's a path through which you can essentially show the US government, um, you know, look, it's going to be in the nation's best interest that you give me a green card, essentially. And if you kind of put together enough credentials, then you can um, you know, apply for that. Meanwhile, I met my um, future wife, uh, who was a US citizen. And of course, that then the, the effect of that was to bring forward the whole timeline by, by a few years. We got married well, well before I finished my PhD. I, think I should get this right. Um, and then, uh, then at that point, that uh, got me the green card. And so, so basically, the, again, like the, the, the plan would have been to continue with the, the F1 visa at that point and then eventually transition to a green card. And I'll say, you know, I, I have a, a English friend of mine who was in very similar situation, didn't get married, went on, did a postdoc at NASA. He, he actually since left and went to Duke University. But um, so, so you can do it without without the marriage part. The, the other part, though, I, I would add is that um, you know, the, the, the difference between my situation versus, say, Annie and Neil right now is that the opportunities within both the UK and Europe in general are a lot different than they were when I was, you know, in, in late 90s. And so, uh, okay, so, so here's a follow on question that I'll ask you that was asked in the, in the right. chat box. And um, there's a perception that the UK is behind other countries in terms of space opportunities. And I just wonder, um, could you comment on that? Do you, do you, do you see a change there? Um, I mean, I think it's moving in the right direction. I, I would say they're behind where they probably should be, given their kind of role in, you know, so many other aspects of of, uh, of the world um, and science and technology and engineering and everything else. Um, you know, I, I think th there's historically been, you know, uh, a kind of preference toward uh, you know, robotic space exploration on the part of the UK, right? And they said, we don't really want any part of human exploration. Um, it seems like that maybe has um, uh, changed to some extent. Certainly there's an interest in it. I mean, we've seen it today, right? And and that that's not new, right? There's always been interest there. Um, do I think that they could do more? Absolutely, I do. Um, okay. But but, but I, I do think it's going in the right direction. 
Okay, so we got a lot of kind of personal type questions for you. Yeah. So the the um, I think the funniest one was um, Frank Mill wanted to know: Did your time at Bayview prepare you for working in extreme conditions? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I so you know what you know what prepared me more than that was one of my jobs when I was in Edinburgh um, was so I, I worked in various pubs. I worked in the Argyle. I worked in Minders Bar. Um, I sold concessions at Tyne Castle at one point. Um, but the, one of the first jobs I had uh, it was toward the end of first year, and you know just ran out of money. Couldn't get a job in any pub or anything like that. So I went to the McDonald's on Princess Street. And I managed to get a job there. And you know, when you're the, I, I wasn't even qualified to flip burgers. They wouldn't let me do that. I was just clear the tables and clean the toilets. And when you're working at one in the morning on Princess Street, um, that that uh, that's an extreme, extreme environment right there. Yeah. Pretty extreme. Okay, that so the, there's a there's a bunch of questions about you know your motivation to get into space. Was it there at primary school, or did it really only wake up when you 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 were you were given the opportunity to go to the space school? So yeah, uh, to be totally honest, it was not on my radar at all. It's not that I wasn't interested in it, but it, you know, it just wasn't even much of a thought or you know, I didn't really see or hear much about it growing up. Uh, okay. It was it was that day when I was 17 and or 16, I suppose it was still at the time, uh, when they brought up, I, I, I went home. This was, you know, at least before we had internet. I got out the encyclopedia and looked up where Houston is, and then just look, looked up NASA and everything else. So it wasn't from uh, that early age, but but yeah, the the, the power of that experience I had um, at, at the space school that really that was the first kind of um, the first thing that had really kind of caught my imagination in terms of what kind of career I would like to pursue. Okay. So we've got a whole bunch of technical questions for you, but I'm saving those for a little while just to kind of warm up. I might, I might okay? be time for the really difficult That's all right. So th there's another one, a common one which has come up is, um, are you a science fiction fan? And if you are, are there any movies, books, etc., that inspire you? And do they inspire you? Um, I do like science fiction. I mean, I, I, I don't read a, a, or watch a ton of it. Um, I like the ones that you know, that make you think, yeah, of course, I've, you know, I love Star Wars. I love, you know, I've watched all the Battlestar Galacticas and everything else. Um, the, my, my wife, who's an aerospace engineering professor at Cal Poly, she, she um, basically forbids her students from watching Armageddon. Um, you know, she, she, she gets really hung up on the things that are kind of factually uh, clearly inaccurate. Um, I, 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 I like, you know, that so the Martian, you know, which you're probably f familiar with, I really like that because it's it's fiction, but it's it's plausible, right? And it really kind of makes you think about kind of what if. Um, I similar category. I like Ready Player One, uh, which is um, not uh, I don't know if you would call that sci-fi. I guess it's sci-fi, um, but I, I really like that because it was it kind of just took where we're at just now, extrapolated a bit, and then looked at these really interesting scenarios that make you think. So. Um, yeah, that, that, that's the kind that I particularly enjoy. OK, so we're still with the easy ones. Did did Chris Hatfield sing and play his guitar in the Nemo mission? And can you remember what he sang? So he did. Um, I do not remember what he sang. He had because he, he had a guitar that he flew on on one of his previous missions on a shuttle mission. I think it especially made. And so uh, and it's, you know, it was kind of a small collapsible one because to get things down into the underwater habitat, you, know, you can't just take your guitar in the water. So, so he had one that kind of fit within this little chamber that we could take down. So, um, yeah, I'm trying. To, I, I, I have pictures of it, but yeah, we would sing along, and it was, and yeah, I mean, it really, it, it was an intentional thing of like, hey, this is a, this is a, a sure. bonding thing for us to do. There, there was a real purpose to it, and he, he viewed his role because he was commander of our Nemo mission as well, and so he viewed his role as, as you know, ensuring team cohesion, and you know, that there's. There's following the objectives, but one of the most difficult things as a as a commander or a lab lead or a chair or whatever it is is like how do you, you know, how do you deal with those soft things and the fact that we're all we're all humans and so, so that's something about, they did. It's all about people, right? Yep, exactly. Okay, so on that cue, let's go to the little bit harder ones. So, uh -oh. question about um talking about humans um. Well, Chris Allen, first of all, has a, what I thought was a bizarre question, but maybe maybe, maybe it's not. Um, it was pr presumably once inconceivable that a child could travel in an airplane. 
Has NASA given any consideration to the challenges of putting children into space? Um, so children, uh, I guess I'll, I'll answer it as, as not specific to children, but the, the idea that we need to now think about sending humans into space who are not professional astronauts, who are not necessarily as aerobically fit, you know, as strong, et cetera. You know, you know, NASA is, is, you know, it's a government agency, but it's supposed to help facilitate, um, you know, commercial organizations and so on to, to start expanding into, you know, the, the space environment, right? And so like SpaceX, Boeing, et cetera. Um, C C space tourism, right, and commercial space, like, like it's, it's not going to be NASA astronauts that are flying a lot of those things. So we need to now think about, okay, well, how do we design spacesuits and occupant protection systems and things like that for someone who may weigh, you know, twice as much as your regular astronaut? You know, they're, they're a billionaire, but they, they don't fit in a spacesuit. So what do we do about that? And so, and then there's all sorts of other um, kind of medical, medical disqualifiers, if you like, that are currently in place for astronauts. You know, if you have a you know kidney stones, things like this, they're like, we're just not going to select you at all, right? So, so we'll just avoid that whole problem. You know, if you're now saying, well, this person is going to fly, how do we how do we make it work? Then that that has become a, an area of focus now, okay. or an area that we are thinking about. So somebody asked, did you ever think yourself of becoming an astronaut? So yes, um, I, you know, of course, kind of going back to your first question, at first it wasn't even eligible to apply not having the right citizenship the, there were two uh, and and then the, the the selections now occur much less frequently than they did when we we're flying multiple shuttle missions per year with five or seven people on them so i've i was able to apply twice uh, there, were, there, there were two uh, two selections for which i was eligible to apply um i both times i actually made it to the final round both times didn't get selected either there's a selection going on now for which i actually didn't apply I kind of got to the point in my life where I felt like the the I, I felt like I was in a good place moving. But for one thing, if I were to be successful now, it'd be going back to Houston uh, and just kind of family wise and everything else. We just kind I think of felt it's, it. I think it's called recalibrating your goals, right? Yeah, yeah, something like okay. that. So, um, so, so yeah. So come, it, come on, you, you mentioned SpaceX and you mentioned um, um, Starship. You know, that that change came around when you were at NASA. How do you feel about working with those commercial organizations? Has it changed the way NASA works? Uh, it has in some respects. It's so so it's um, it, it, I, 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 to answer the first part of the question, I feel very good about it. It's you know it's an intentional thing by NASA, right? Where the sure. commercial crew program, uh, well, commercial cargo and then commercial crew program was part of this uh, like express. Uh, objective to have it be where NASA stops doing all the low Earth orbit part. You know, the, NASA doesn't have enough budget to, to keep running the space shuttle, the space station and build the new rockets and Orion and landers and everything else. So um, the intent was to, to partner with these US commercial companies, basically work with them to develop these new vehicles and the ability to launch astronauts and kind of NASA, there is no market for it right now, right? So the government, NASA is kind of the the, the only market right now. So, so they're trying to kind of foster this. So so we would work with them uh, and so we need them to be successful. Our, our path to the moon and Mars requires them to be successful. And so so we and we, we literally work on a day to day basis in many cases with them on um, on the design and certification of the vehicles. The, the second part of your question about like, does it, has it changed the way NASA works? Um, and, and to some extent, yes. Uh, and, you know, and I think there's, you know, they, they bring different, well, especially in the, the SpaceX, SpaceX example, right? Because you've got Boeing on the one hand, who's, that's just one of the kind of aer aerospace giants, right? And so we kind of know how, they, they know how NASA works and vice versa. SpaceX, a bit different. And so, and, and both, both in you know in some very good and refreshing ways and some but also in some cases where it's like hey you know we tried that 25 years ago and here's why we don't do that anymore right so so th there's a bit of both um but i think it's it's been good i'd say that there's yeah there, there's at least my, my experience of, of it at, at my level has has been that it, it's good it's been healthy it's kind of uh, it's made kind of both that they're they're separate parts of the same team is kind of how I look at it. And, and both parts of it have kind of made the other better, I think. Um, and, and yeah, like looking ahead to, to Lunar, it'll be, 
you know, just from what's already kind of publicly available about these different lunar lander concepts, completely different approach from SpaceX. Sure. Right? And, and I think that's wonderful. I think it's great. Could I make a little plug uh, for any of Please. the people that are um, listening and watching? Uh, if they'd like to support our student project teams and some of the other teams we have around ground transport and transport that hasn't been invented like the Hyperloop. Uh, we have launched uh, an engineering student innovation fund and Caroline is going to put up the link uh, in the chat for anybody that'd like to contribute and support these uh, fantastic engineers. I was going to say engineers of the future, but no, they're engineers of the present. And OK, so let me get back to so we're talking about decision making and um, Chris Allen has asked another question. He says it's clear that making your hardware and technology trustworthy and reliable is critical. But presumably in the near future, astronauts will also need to be able to trust the artificial intelligence technologies and robot decision making that will support space travel in the future. Is this something that you guys are thinking of more? And maybe I'd add, you know, where does the human machine interface come in? And are we going to be looking at humanoid, ro humanoid robotics like Boston Dynamics have? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so it is something that, yeah, that, of course, that's a bit further out there, especially as we start thinking about Mars, right, where the, right now, the way that we operate in low Earth orbit, and it will probably be similar on the moon because the communication latency, right, the, 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 the time delay, if you like, of communications from the moon to Earth is still very small, right, in the order of a couple seconds, right? When you start getting into the minutes, um, delay, there are a lot of things that can happen on a spacecraft or in a spacesuit that will kill you in, you know, seconds or a few minutes. And so by the time the ground actually kind of sees that, you know, it's already played out and they're already dead. Um, the, the way we operate right now is we have a large team of dozens and dozens of ground controllers on the ground keeping a close eye on everything. And to, to Chris's question there, yeah, we're going to have to, some of that will still happen for things that it doesn't matter if it takes, a, you know, several minutes or an hour or a day to make the decision. It can still happen that way. There are other things, particularly with respect to life support, that are going to have to either be done by the, the astronauts themselves, but but quickly you get to the point where, you know, the, you can't train them enough and they'll, they'll have no, there will not be enough hours in the day for them to take care of all that. So, yeah, you, you need these autonomous systems. Um, the... NASA, and so, so less my own lab, um, but NASA is spending a lot of time, effort and money on these autonomous systems and the autonomous technologies to um, b b both for things like life support, but then also, and I, w w one that my own team is actually working on is, and we're kind of calling it decision support systems, where at, when you're doing a spacewalk on Mars and you want to decide, oh, I would really like to go and grab these other shiny rocks over here, that's really interesting. Um, you know, do, w w what are the implications of doing that? You know, in terms of the thermal environment, is there a radiation storm coming? Is am I going to run out of oxygen? Is it going to put me out of communication range with the satellite? You know, all these things that are dealt with by the ground right now have to be put on the crew member, their spacesuit, and or the spacecraft that they're operating out of. So we are kind of working that part. The, the trust. The, the trust part of the question is interesting because there is the human research program, HRP, is a part of NASA. And so I know that, and it's not something that I've per, had personal experience with, but there are people doing research on that very question of trust. And, sure. and you know, uh, and so, so that's that's part that I'm not going to pretend to uh, know or understand enough about the, the state of that research, but I, but I do know that it's something that is a, a research question. Okay. So I've met another which I think is a very good question. It's from a veterinary, veterinarian that's uh, listening. So it's not just engineers online. And um, uh, they ask, um, it says, I am an exotic and wildlife veterinari veterinarian and my job takes me to a lot of extreme environments. I was wondering, are there any animal models that are being used in designing life support systems? I believe wildlife physiology and adaptations could prove incredibly useful for providing inspiration. That's a, that, that is a really interesting question. Um, animal models for life support I'm not familiar with. Uh, you know, we use animal models for things like muscle atrophy. You know, I mentioned things like muscle atrophy, bone mineral density loss, things like that. Uh, uh, we have in the past. I, I've not been a part of those studies, but um, yeah, that, that, that's one of the, the common approaches there. Things like you'll take, you know, hind limb suspension of rats and things like that. Um, as, as a model for, for those kinds of physiological responses. 
Um, the idea of, of for life support, I've not looked at. I, I am kind of motivated to go and have a little look into that and see if anyone's okay. thought about it. The, 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 I'll say that the, there's been thought about using, um, you know, like al algae and, you know, can you use as part of your life support system, you know, can you, and I think this is in one of David, uh, Andy Weir's books as well, the idea of kind of using algae and, and kind of feeding on that as, as, you know, kind of where your food system is part of your overall life support system. But I'm, I'm going to see what I can find out. OK, I wonder, would you be willing to provide some written answers to some of the questions maybe afterwards? Because we're not uh, going to get through the questions. There's so many. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to. I know better than to promise that, but uh, <laughs> let, let me. Let me well, let maybe me some of the interesting up. ones. OK, yeah. there's a yeah, couple there. of more lighthearted ones about, um, well, a little bit perhaps not lighthearted. The one question was in in Antarctica, what were the worrying incidents? Oh, huh. um, yeah, there were. Um, so, I mean, one in particular uh, during a so during a one of the dives, one of the ice dives, um, I had it where I'll again it's kind of spare the details. Essentially, you know, so you're wearing this kind of full face mask, and it got to where um, the 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 mask basically kind of fogged over. I, and I, without realizing it, I was going under this kind of dark part, and then got out the other side, and I just couldn't see anything at all. I couldn't see my depth gauge or anything, and. Uh, and so then, you know, I kind of dropped to the bottom and then started kind of getting uh, almost getting vertigo. And so um, but it was, you know, one of those moments where I've, I was already I knew kind of almost at the bottom. So I kind of knew enough about where I was um, to kind of recalibrate, um, get, get, get a get a grip again and, and kind of um, finish the dive safely, essentially. But, but yeah, the, 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 uh, yeah, so, so that, that was probably the most, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll call that worrying one. Yeah. OK, one of our students wants to know how you made the dive hole through the ice in Antarctica. Oh, yeah, uh, I wonder, I may have a picture of that. Give me a second. Um, it is a combination of drilling, melting and sawing. Oh, yeah, I do have it. Nice. Um, so yeah, you, you start with a drill. Uh, apologies for the units here, but um, uh, what's the uh, you drill down? You you're adding on sections of, of flighting here, so you get it to where you kind of break through uh, and get a, a ten inch uh, diameter uh, hole there. Then on the top right there, you've got this uh, basically generator that's then heating and pumping. What what you don't see there is a brass coil. That then it pumps this fluid through it, this warm fluid. So you, you lower the, the brass coil down into the water below the bottom of the ice, and then you let that run. And so it's just pumping warm water, which then just over the course of about 24 hours gradually melts more and more of a, of a hole. But you still end up with the, the kind of uh, the, the top 12 inches or so where the water actually doesn't come up that high. You have to then saw that out. And so, uh, yeah, that, that, um, that chainsaw you see there has got about a, a meter long bar in it. So then you're kind of chopping that out. You chop a little step and, and you're good to go. OK, um, I've got one here about what, what's your opinion on using legged rovers or manned vehicles for transportation through extreme terrain? Um, are there any projects? This person knows what they're talking about. Any, any projects related to legged locomotion other than athlete? I haven't heard of athlete, but perhaps you have. Oh, athlete, yeah. So, 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 yeah, legged locomotion. So, sorry, let me just move this window back down here. Um, as far as I'm aware, so, 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 so the, the just real briefly, the athlete concept, and then there was the the tri athlete concept was a was a um, a robotic system which you can probably Google it online, um, where you got wheels on the end of robotic legs. And then you've got, you know, essentially six of these um, on a um, frame. And then the, the, the concept there was that you could kind of both, you know, translate back and forth, but also use it to drive up to a lander or something like that and offload a payload that's maybe several meters off the, the lunar surface and take it off. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no, um, there, there are no, at least on the NASA side, kind of legged, uh, kind of surface systems planned for the moon. The athlete concept is is actually pretty interesting, uh, and I, my my take on it, like the, the benefits of it, are that the scale of of terrain that you can navigate with something like that, where if your if your wheel doesn't roll over it, you lift the wheel up and just put it on the other side, right? So so 
the, the concept I think is actually very, very interesting, and very good. The, the, the rover concepts we're working on right now are, you know, they're kind of like the, um, you know, the, the lunar electric rover concept we saw there. You've got active and passive suspension, but not actually legs per se. So, uh, okay. yeah. um, we're coming towards the end here. So, um, I'm going to ask you one question, which I think might be relevant for our students. Um, you mentioned that soft skills are being considered during the application process, etc. And, and you mentioned yourself how your job is totally different now as the leader of the lab versus earlier. And what type of, of na leadership training is provided by NASA in order to develop soft skills, you know, at all levels, right up to crews and mission control members, etc. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. NASA is quite good about uh, kind of providing training opportunities in almost any different area. And so they do offer kind of leadership courses, things where they'll have, you know, anonymous kind of peer review. You know, you'll kind of contact 20 of your sort of people, whether they work for you or people above you, or whatever else, and they kind of provide feedback on you and what are you doing well, what are you not doing well, things like that. Um, and so, so NASA has been quite good about um, providing opportunities there. What, what I would say just in general, just to kind of maybe reinforce that the, the importance of the soft skills, whether you're in a leadership role or a followership role or, or whatever, just the, the importance of that from my perspective has, has been like, it, it's hard to hard to overstate that. And, and it's one of the things I took out of, of Edinburgh, some of the project work that I did uh, in, in the engineering department there. Um, the, the the technical skills I learned, some of them I've, I've subsequently applied, but but kind of learning how to work as part of a, a team, uh, th there's there's no substitute for that. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but um, but the, it, it's also that now as we're as we're recruiting and trying to find people to to join our team, it's it's one of the hardest things to to identify. You know, you can't it's, yeah. it's hard to communicate that in a resume or even in a in an interview. It's kind of really hard to to get it without really um, getting to know them better which is why we do a lot of internships. We like to bring in a lot of interns of and actually kind of see how they yeah. see how they perform and see how they interact. Because there, there's lots of really talented, skillful people out there. Finding the ones who know how to be part of a team, that's sure. priceless. Sure, I have a comment here from Tom Bruce. Um, he says he's watching it with, with your, Tom used to, used, used to teach Andrew, and he, he's watching it with his 16 year old who's just starting out on uh, loving um, higher physics. And he says, this is a football reference now. We see, do you get it? He says, until now, I thought that Callum Davidson was our most accomplished student. <laughs> I don't know if you know Callum. He's the current manager of Dundee United. I do. I do. Well, I don't know, don't, don't know him personally. I know who he is, yeah. OK, and a couple of people asking, could you see a time when you'd be working back in Scotland or even working in Europe with the European Space Agency, perhaps? Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's fine. Um, don't, I don't want to get too political or anything at this point, but you know, let's just say that it, it, the, the thought has occurred. Like, where else might we live if it if, if it came to it? So, um, but the, the the idea of of uh, I'll say as, at some stage in the in the career, of course, we're we're a, a two body problem as we call it, right? We've, we've got my my wife and, and myself, uh, and so anywhere we go, we'd like to try and find someone that we can both do. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of end up um, back in Scotland, at least on a sort of uh, sabbatical or something like that. We took a we took a almost year long sabbatical a couple of years ago. Travelled around a lot. Didn't uh, yeah, and that was more a family experience. But the idea of of kind of relocating at least temporarily somewhere is kind of a. Well, I can I can make an offer, which hopefully the principal will back me on, is that the <laughs> School of Engineering at the University of Edinburgh would love to solve your two body problem, even on a temporary basis, and you'd be very welcome to come and work with our students and with our researchers, etc., even for a, a limited amount of time. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go tell Kira. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Um, OK, so listen, I've enjoyed very much talking to you, enjoyed your presentation very much and um, give a lot of food for thought there. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Stephen Warrington, who knows you a lot better than I do, and he, he's just going to say a few words before the principal wraps things up. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Kahur. Uh, as Andrew said, he started his degree at Edinburgh. Um, actually, I looked up his record on the 6th of October 1997. Uh, John Chick was his personal tutor, and I first came across Andrew when he took my uh, second semester course in second year techniques and management. Uh, 
As Andrew mentioned, he was at Buckhaven High School from 92 to 97. He attained uh, A's in all of his five hires, which were English, maths, physics, chemistry and biology. So even back then when he was at high school, he still had a good broad appreciation across all the sciences. And from what he's presented tonight, that's something that stood him well uh, across all the roles that he's had. Again, as I said, after his trip to NASA for the space school, he went back there to carry out his placement uh, as a part of his integrated master's degree. There he worked on the experimental emergency crew vehicle for the International Space Station, which was called the X-38. Um, that's not an express version of the bus that um, Frank Mill, <laughs> Tom Bruce and I take from Shandon to, to King's Buildings. Um, Andrew's work was centred on the X-38, which I said was an International Space Station um, escape pod, in effect, that um, had the International Space Station lost its power, uh, it would need to know what its current position was and what its orientation was to be able to get back to, to Earth. Uh, never mind when you were do undocking, um, colliding with the International Space Station. Uh, John Chick, coincidentally, uh, Andrew's personal tutor and myself, while on other business in the US, uh, headed down to Houston to meet up with Andrew at Johnson Space Centre uh, to see the work that he was doing and get a tour of the facilities. Uh, we were also, of course, trying to sniff around uh, NASA to see if we could uh, facilitate a, a better link to try and get uh, other placements uh, a, a bit a bit easier, as, as one of the students had asked about er earlier on. Uh, John and I had a great time. We were able to try the X-38 simulator. Uh, John uh, was much better than I was. I collided and destroyed the International Space Station and probably the X-38 on <laughs> departure. But even after Andrew's invaluable contribution, the X-38 was unfortunately cancelled the next year uh, due to cost cutting measures. We were also able to try the simulator for the Canada arm, which is the robotic arm that was used on the space shuttle to manoeuvre the satellites and other payloads. Uh, the, day, the, the date that John and I visited Houston and left Houston is always very fresh in our, in our minds as uh, a couple of days after we did fly back uh, was the terrible events of 9-11. Of What's really worrying me more than anything else is that uh, it doesn't seem all that long ago, but actually I was Andrew's age when I visited him back there uh, all, the, all, all those uh, almost 20, 20 years ago. Uh, it's always fantastic to see your students' careers develop after the graduation, and it's particularly great to see Andrew again after all these these years, particularly after our, our days in uh, in Houston, um, even if it is virtually as opposed to in person. And also to see the contribution that he's made to NASA's development of mission equipment and spacesuits. Um, and as we've seen uh, tonight, the, the the work of NASA isn't all rocket science. It's also great to see that he hasn't lost his Fife accent and he's not got some <laughs> West Coast drawl. So thank you very much for your presentation tonight. And I'm sure as Kuhura has already said that he knows he's very welcome to visit the school again uh, the next time he's back in Scotland. So I'd like now to pass back to Pro Professor Peter Matheson, Principal and Vice Chancellor of the University, to deliver a vote of thanks to you, Andrew, for your interesting and inspiring presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Yeah, so I will get to some thanks for um, uh, for Andrew. Just, be, just in case I forget, I want to do a few other thanks first. So um, can I thank uh, Annie on behalf of Asteria and Neil on behalf of Endeavour for illustrating some of the uh, really interesting and ingenious and, and, and very important work that some of our current students are doing. That was great to hear. Thanks to Kaher for uh, chairing the question and answer and to Stephen for his words about uh, Andrew, that's all been a great part of the evening. So thank you for all your contributions. And to Rebecca, Karen and the team and everybody that's been involved in organising as efficiently as they always do. We, we we come to expect very efficient organisation and we always get it. And so thank you very much to everybody involved in, in, in that. Um, most of all, though, of course, thanks to Andrew. I mean, Andrew, it was a magnificent uh, presentation. I think you're so 
um, matter of fact about the way you describe things like not being able to see when you're down underneath the Antarctic ice and whatnot. It, it, you must be uh, you must be a very interesting human being in, in terms of psychology and and and, and manner and and, uh, and and approach in all sorts of ways. And I, as a human biologist, I'm really interested in the sort of the human aspects of all the things that you talked about. Um, the great thing about your talk was that I understood it all. That's always a bonus for me. Um, <laughs> but, but it was fantastic. I think, you know, you, you've taken us from space to Antarctica, underwater, volcanoes, goodness knows where else. You've illustrated some of the extraordinarily interesting things that you have uh, uh, undertaken in your in your illustrious career. I also thought your ability to answer questions and answers, including a few um, uh, uh, sidewinders, you know, that were actually a little bit uh, uh, way beyond your necessarily your primary field of expertise. But I thought you did so brilliantly. Um, it was a great demonstration. Made me feel very proud to be the principal of your alma mater. If our university can produce people like you that can go on and do the interesting things that you've done in various different uh, disciplines, uh, then uh, we, we should be very pleased with ourselves. And I hereby confirm that I do support the School of Engineering's proposal to bring you and your wife back to Edinburgh. Um, the documents will be in the post tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but uh, please, uh, I suppose you might need to talk to your kids first. I don't know how they'd feel about it, but um, we'd love to have you back as a visitor, uh, uh, as a sabbatical or as a hire. So uh, whatever, whatever you're interested in, please talk to us. Um, but anyway, with that, um, thank you to you. Thank you to everybody for attending for some really great questions. Uh, and I'm sorry we didn't manage to get through them all, but that's always a sign of success if you have more questions than you have time to answer. Andrew, I hope to meet you in person sometime rather than virtually. Um, but until then, thank you so much. Thank you for all the excellent work you've done. And thank you for being a great ambassador for uh, the University of Edinburgh in general and the School of Engineering in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an absolute privilege and uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. And, and yeah, I will uh, hope to see you in Edinburgh in one, one, one uh, role or another uh, before too long. <laughs> Great. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Uh